What's up, guys? Welcome back to Sweat Equity, episode 37. On today's episode, I'm going to be talking about how to build in retention best practices to your brand's content and use some examples that we can all learn from. Alex, what do you got? So I'm going to be talking about Wimbledon, uh, a few things there, just the the absolute volume, like sheer volume of content that they put out within a 14 day span and how they nearly added a million followers within that 14 day span. And then some of the layers within their strategy that we're using uh, for a brand to to uh, launch their shoe at the CrossFit game. So Love it. that's what I got. But Love fuck, it. dude, it is it's hot. It's hot. It's yeah. hot. So we know the name of the pod is Sweat Equity, et cetera. It's about 100 degrees in Texas. And one of the fans in our AC unit went out. So if you see me like sus kind of wiping my brow like this, just know it's because it's. And just watch the way he wipes it. Yeah. It's, I mean, the prima donna very stuff European. has just gone into it's very full European. effect. very European. Yeah. Like, it's like, you know. No, nah, it's like aristocratic <laughs> vibes. I'm surprised <laughs> it's not a little cloth. Anyways, um, so there are two things that really amplify content in today's yeah. algorithms, and that is retention and shareability. So on today's episode, I want to talk about retention and so, all the things that I kind of learned about in a deep dive for that. And then on next week's episode, I'll talk about how to optimize for creating shareability in your content. But the first thing I want to say is the sooner you realize content is a science, the easier your life is going to get. All of these things have very like specific formats that you can use to include uh, retention best practices in your video. So what are some of those things? I kind of pulled together a combination of three creators that I respect a lot, which would be Sean Perry, uh, Henry Belcaster from Clifton on YouTube. He's got, I think, close to a million subscribers now. It's over a mil. Yeah, close to way two over. Mil. Yeah. And so uh, Patty Galloway as well, who yeah. is I love one, of the, yeah, one of the most well-known YouTubers. And all three of them talk about some different ways to keep someone's attention because there's so much in today's world that emphasizes the hook, the hook, the hook. And the hook is 90% of what you should focus on, truly. Like, yeah. if you don't have a good hook, then your video is not going to get watched. But- the hook is just one component of a successful video because the reason why things get amplified is past the hook, what is your average watch time? Are you getting a video to 60, 70% watched depending on how long it is? And how do we do that? There's three things that you want to include in every single video. So that's number one is the setup. Number two is the conflict. And number three is the resolution. So let's go into what makes a successful setup. You wanna introduce the heroes of the video. This is you know, hopefully if it's a relatable video, it's like you are the hero. Like I'm creating this video so that you, the person watching can learn something yeah. and achieve something. Or um, you also, there. the other alternative is you can tease an upcoming challenge that's gonna occur in the video. So, you know, don't freeze dry anything till you watch this video. And it's gonna show like later on, you're gonna give them, you know, like you're setting up what is gonna happen later on in the video. Yeah. And then third in this one is from uh, a recent episode Sean did with David Perel is outline their intention and the obstacle. That's on David Perel's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, it was good. Sorry about that. Really yeah. good. No, it was really good. And when you outline the intention of what the person, like what is going to happen in the story, it almost creates something in someone's brain where they're looking for the obstacle. Because similar to what a lot of the South Park guys say about like, but therefore, and a lot of our friends will say about their social content, which is introducing head fakes and, you know, kind of pattern interrupting people. Like when someone sees the intention behind a viral video, they are thinking like, what is the eventual obstacle going to be? What is the roadblock? And so your job is then to make those things as compelling and as interesting as possible. So, you know, your setup is where you are table setting what the video is going to be about to then introduce the conflict, which is one of these two things. It's either very relatable. It's you're resolving a conflict that your audience experiences themselves. So you're trying to show like, Hey, if I'm someone who has always been curious about, uh, what size of boots, like the video could be what, what size of boot, what type of leather should I get for my boots? Like yep. what does the leather in my boots say about me? then don't buy boots until you watch this video could be the hook. And then all of a sudden you're looking for like, what is the actual conflict that's going to get resolved? Well, it's going to be the difference between all of these different leathers, mm -hmm. the difference between all these different shapes and sizes. Um, on the flip side, and this is more popular on YouTube, I would say for like pure entertainment value videos, like pure like viral videos and entertainment is 
really that novelty and that extremism. So uh, if you pay attention to any Mr. Beast video or all these YouTubers, that it's it's always like the world's fastest yeah. or the world's greatest or like the cra it's it's like the absolute most extreme thing that could be happening. So in the thread that uh, Patty talks about his his video process, it's racing the world's fastest drone versus an F1 car. And they use Max Verstappen from Red Bull. Red Bull publishes the video. Like he follows this exact framework. Like he introduces Max at the beginning of the video, shows like a little bit of like a zoom from the drone and then shows like a little bit of the F1 car yeah. and like sets the table for like these th two things are about to race. Yeah. And then there's finally, a, go ahead. There's a another one too where you're able to do that with contrast, like very similar yes. where you can go and this is what I, I talked about maybe two episodes ago that like my friend Brian is starting his own uh, lure line for, for yeah. fishing that yeah. it's uh, uh, like whatever for like saltwater and freshwater fishing. It's lures where you can create hundred dollar lure versus a one dollar lure. Right. And you could create the conflict there by having the contrast of price and the effectiveness between the lures to then navigate the story. For sure. Yeah. And exactly. I think Mr. Beast does that as well. He does one where it's like a uh, hundred dollar car, a thousand dollar car, ten thousand dollar car, a hundred thousand dollar car, yep. million dollar car. Yep. Right. And you're able to layer in all of this contrast and create like the the different conflicts within there uh, with the contrast. I might actually need to get my own paper towel, get a little sweat wiping. Yeah. You see this? No, it's real. It's real. See, this shit is OD you see hot this? with the lights on. Please keep this. Keep that section in the in the pod. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I was looking at my reflection in your forehead for the last 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> no, no, this is definitely, this is like an absolute pool just developing. You got one forehead. big one. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So what makes like a successful resolution to a conflict? It's, you obviously want to include the climax, which is something that it's been building up to. So, yeah. you know, no brainer in Patty's case, again, it's the F1 drone versus the, F, or I'm sorry, the, the world's fastest drone versus the F1 car. Yeah. Obviously, you want to show this climactic final lap where you don't know who's actually going to win. And the the core thing you want to check off here is, you know, you want to answer everything that's included in the setup. So the next thing that most of our listeners will, will be looking for here is uh, what is an example of a brand that is doing this really well? And um, I saw a thread from Isaac, the founder of Mini Katana, the other day on Twitter and decided to kind of look into his new freeze dried candy brands, YouTube shorts. Yeah. And it was pretty startling because you actually end up seeing all of these things to our point at the beginning of the video, like this is a science, like that man understands how to produce viral content at scale so that every video has the hallmarks that can potentially make it go viral. What's that brand called again? Uh, can pie, can pie foods. Spell it. K A N P A I. Con pie maybe. Um, gotcha. I don't know. It's some real anime shit. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, it's not my vibe, but that's all good. Like, um, so three videos that he uh, uses, and we'll we'll link these and obviously put them up on the YouTube. But um, his his first hook is you're eating candy wrong, and then he goes into this is what you've been missing. Here's the one change you need to make for your health, and it's like kind of silly. The, the video has a lighthearted tone. It's got a lot of heavy editing. It's a very uh, YouTuber vibe to it. And eventually he loops it around to, this is how, this is what is actually making you in danger of your health, which is that candy's getting stuck in your teeth, which ruins your heart. And he kind of like connects those dots. And then the fix is you have to freeze dry your candy to ultimately uh, make it not stick in your teeth. Yeah. So again, he's setting up a conflict that has a resolution. He's setting up that, you know, you're eating candy wrong and this is the one change you need to make. The conflict then becomes that previously candy would get stuck in your teeth and so that would lead to health complications and the resolution is if you just freeze dry it, then you don't have this problem. Again, it's a way of seamlessly integrating his product into a short form video that has all of these different retention and entertainment based principles. Um, he does, he, it's in every, it's, it's a fine line because some of the stuff that he's done that goes most viral is just outrageous, but a lot of other videos that he's made have these same principles. So again, 
don't freeze dry anything until you watch this video. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just saw that one. So he sets up what you're going to watch. He describes the obstacle that the hero is facing. And again, their intention is they are someone who wants to freeze dry, but the obstacle is what you're going to eventually watch in that video. And then he also teases all these different things that people do. And I think teasing is something that like really keeps people longer is like, this is what you've been missing. If this sounds like you, here's the one change you need to make. Like those are actually valuable fluff lines instead of a lot of stuff is, is, you know, saying the same thing over and over again. That's if you're teasing something later in the video, it can actually have a strong impact. Um, and the last thing is, uh, last video example is which is better freeze dried or regular foods. And so, um, he then goes into, I'm going to try the regulars while the others freeze dry proceeds to kind of like set up more of the eventual conflict and resolution. He's, he's trying grapes. He goes, that's a good grape. It's, Oh, I'm going to try grape juice. It's kind of tart. The whole time he's saying we're freeze drying these products to try them again. So to your point earlier, there's contrast, there's, you know, kind of some extreme nature to it. Like he's literally freeze drying something during the course of the video. So eventually, you know, the conflict is the upcoming disparity, which is, um, you know, and it gets resolved through the freeze dried candy being tastier. So there's this girl, Jenny Hoyos on YouTube. And a lot of the things that you're talking about, um, where, for example, people try to set up a video by saying like, and number one is the thing that you have to do. One thing that I really like and, and an underrated tactic in retention building in a video is foreshadowing yeah. and putting something at the beginning of the video that is really the you're basically taking the end of the video, putting it at the beginning of the video to set the context and like show a glimpse of the payoff and then going into the story. Yeah. What Jenny does is any of these videos. So, for example, one dollar boba versus cafe. It starts off by showing a quick shot of the one dollar boba, the ten dollar boba. And then it goes into the story. So within, you know, two seconds, yeah. she used the foreshadowing to set Absolutely. the context, show the payoff, but it doesn't give you enough context to to uh, make you not want to watch the video because of it. Now you want to see the story unfold. And no so doubt. she does this an incredible job. She does a lot of like the, you know, one dollar versus ten dollars, uh, like, uh, you do know, you, video types where do you get more food using a celebrity's name. Yeah, or like what does one dollar get you at Starbucks? What, What's the right, cheapest like, item in an airport? Yeah, it's it's super extreme and super relatable. It's super novel. Um, but watch all of the hooks. All of the hooks are relatively the same. They all foreshadow and they show the end result and then bring you right into the story. So it's like this is a one dollar boba versus a ten dollar boba. So today I was thinking about you know, and it goes right into that story yeah. before, yeah. Um, which is super good. I mean, it's again, it's like why. Uh, so I she think was, she had this span of averaging ten million views per YouTube Shorts, which is like, yeah, she's going one down. video can change an entire business. She must have a billion dollar or a billion view video in here. I would, I would guess. I mean, one of these. I built a secret room with zero dollars, one hundred forty nine mil. So her biggest is one hundred and forty nine million. Views. Yeah, got it. This is another thing that uh, Patty actually uses. It. He includes in that thread. Um, again, this thread we'll try and link it in the in the description because it's like such a value bomb. Patty Galloway is a YouTube editor that's worked with Mr. Beast, Red Bull, all sorts of high end clientele, and he's got this five step framework to identify a good idea. So number one, is it interesting to both or to all three of these a core, casual, and new audience? So that expands how many people can actually want to watch the video and gives you the best chance to get their attention no matter what the hook is. Number two, is it easy to convey in a title and a thumbnail? So I think this forces a lot of simplicity upon your idea. It's, it's the classic thing in copywriting, constraint forces clarity, where if you are limited to a certain amount that you can say, then you have to be as direct about it as possible. And again, it ties into the extremism that happens in a lot of these videos where you are using the most attention grabbing aspect of your video in that title. Yeah. Number three, unique and super novel. So how do you, you know, stand out from the crowd? How do you create something that people haven't seen before that they want to see? Number four combines viral formats. So there's plenty of different inspiration you can find on YouTube. For example, Mr. B saying, I'm giving $1 million to anyone who leaves my island. Like any single, any brand can do some sort of like, I'm giving X to person who does extreme scenario. And you can just apply that to whatever your brand is. 
And that's how you kind of copy viral formats. And then five is just, do your friends get excited when you mention it? Do, yeah. do people literally just perk up when you talk about the idea? Yeah. Because as you probably know, I mean, a lot of the time when you say something to people, they're like, oh, that's cool. Or they'll be like, and they're oh. just saying that to not hurt your feelings. And then they're straight up. People, yeah. Yeah. And, and then there's, there's moments where like then they're off they it. buy into the idea. Yeah. So let me show you how you can grow your brand like Air One. So let's be real. A six-year-old brand integrating influencer marketing into their strategy. It's pretty interesting. So the idea is then what's stopping your brand from doing the same thing? I get it. Sourcing and sealing deals with influencers is a nightmare. Using spreadsheets, we know that's not easy. And tracking deliverables is insanely tedious. And most of the time, influencers just drop the ball. But here's the thing. It's 2024 and we have way better solutions than what we did even a year ago. And definitely in comparison to what we had 10 years ago. And that's where Soral comes in. Because with Soral, you can build a list of influencers. So think of like a CRM, but for influencer marketing. You can send out automated outreach sequences. And you could create and track relationships at different stages of the funnel. Working with a top of funnel influencer versus a bottom of funnel influencer is a different thing. And they have different requirements and different content needs. But here's the craziest part for brands like yours. And that's that brands are, that are working with Soral are averaging a 5X ROAS, which is nearly double what most brands are seeing on Facebook right now. So here's the thing. If you want to take it for a spin, we got you a free trial via Sweat Equity. And all you got to do is click the link that I put in my bio. You'll also see the link right here. And trust me when I say it, it's the only tool you really need to build out a good and robust influencer marketing program. So check it out. Let me know how you like it and try it for free. I'll give I'll actually give context. There, there's been multiple times where like I'm pitching Fies on ideas for my videos. And some are like, oh, that'd be a banger. And then some are like, uh, and then yesterday, and you know, this ties into even what I'm going to talk about today, but I started off by saying, you know, if I was like, you, you want to hear something crazy about Wimbledon, they created a thousand pieces of content in 14 days, over 500 videos. I was like, that's what I'm making a video about today is their content strategy. And he was like, he lit up. He's like, oh, yeah. that has potential. Like yeah. that could get a million views for sure. And it was like, because it was so intriguing and there was like that mind, it, uh, it might be even Sean or somebody else that, that talks about like what reaction you want to create mm -hmm. out when you're, when you know, when you're creating a piece of content, what reaction, what emotional reaction do you want to get out of somebody? And that is one of those like WTF moments, right? Yeah. Like I say they created a thousand pieces of content in 14 days and it's like, like WTF, right? Like right. what, how, you know, it creates that we're to the point where that layer of emotion is now uh working in congruency with retention based tactics to like get somebody to watch the whole video because if i say at the beginning that they they uh created a thousand videos you instantly want to know how do you create a thousand videos mm -hmm. like what are you going to create a thousand videos about you know like how do you pull something like that off so and and you're pirating wimbledon's brand name and oh, 100%. It's, it's current relevance it's an excellent way to news jack while adding your unique spin to it yeah. Like you talk about content formats, types, execution. And so this thing that is extremely trending, which is Wimbledon. Now yeah. you're going to give, you know, a unique spin that only Alex can give. But again, if you are someone listening to that, wondering how do I actually apply to myself? It's like, what is something that was trending in your space and happened recently? Or it could be as macro as Wimbledon. It could yeah. be something that was that broad. And then what is the unique perspective that you can give on it? Like, what are you qualified to actually say about that given both your life ex and professional experiences? Um, great, I mean, that's a great way to never run out of something to say because there's always shit going on that you could comment on very yeah. specifically. The the thing that I did differently this time in comparison to to the other times that I've like quote unquote news jacked was, so in the past I took something like the 7-Eleven thing when they did the Jamar Chase, always open chain, all that, right? All I did there was tell the story. Right. I looked at what was relevant in the news. I looked at what was trending on ESPN and Google Trends. And I just told the story from the marketing lens. Mm -hmm. What I did differently this time was I took what was trending. I took something that that was very relevant, still hyper relevant. I had a 24 hour window to make that video, but I integrated it into one of my pillar content types. In the past, it was it would have been something like, you know, just talking about Wimbledon's marketing strategy or like, look at this crazy marketing strategy, whatever. But this was brands doing content very right, Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. So I took, so, and the reason I, I did that was, if you look at one of my, my pieces of content, like brands doing content right versus one I news jack. Okay, so that 7-Eleven video has maybe 800,000 followers. I mean, has 800,000 views, like in that realm. It only brought me under 500 followers. 
Mm. Right. One of my brands doing content right that has a hundred thousand fo- or a hundred thousand views brought me over fifteen hundred followers. Mm. Right. So there's there's <clears throat> something about take you don't want to just be the one telling the news. It's the same thing when uh you told me to to talk about the uh American Airlines stunt that they pulled with Taylor Swift, mm. remember before the Super Bowl? And it went mega viral, got like twenty to thirty thousand likes, and it only drove like two hundred followers you know nothing significant oh, but so now, now it's my fault no okay no, no no i mean it's eyeballs is eyeballs you know i got 17 dollars from twitter for that yeah <laughs> I, I didn't see none of it <laughs> <laughs> i get you through royalties but the yeah but the the thing is if you can now flip it into one of your actual content pillars and then make it more valuable where somebody's taking something away from it r- versus just spewing news then that conversion rate from from profile visit from view to profile visit to follower is significantly higher and wow. i'm already seeing that with this video that's at you know 30 something thousand views in the in less than 24 hours mm-hmm. it's already brought in a few hundred followers it's so fascinating because i think what you're describing is literally what you can only do versus what anyone could do in terms of why people are following you if you're just spreading the news, if you're just the news anchor, yeah, no one gives a shit. Yeah. But if you're the person that they're going to for their opinion, like they're waiting for Alex's take on something, yeah, then that's such a higher conversion rate for followers. And again, I think if you take it back to where is the most valuable place to build an audience versus where is the easiest place to build an audience, this is why it's so easy to build on TikTok because you go viral and you just, you get like a, mil- a couple million you know, likes on something mega viral and you get all these followers and then they don't see your next post. Whereas if you build on YouTube, people are actively subscribing so that they see your next thing. 100%. And uh, I think what you just described is a perfect example of I I think you like set it up perfectly where, you know, one of my friends texted me recently and was like, can you help me make actual meaningful content that like drives some, you know, kind of result, whether it's business, whether it's followers. And And I told him like the simplest framing that changed it for me was, when I thought about how can I become a resource for people, it was the ultimate frame breaking thing that made me understand that people want to follow you because they want they they want to get a piece of content that creates that expectation that they know what they're going to get from you. Yeah. You know you're going to be getting content marketing and, and marketing playbook breakdowns and strategy development from my page. And and so, a focus on like health and wellness and yeah, active wear and all that stuff. One hundred percent. And so from that, I become a resource of information for that. They could always come back to my page. They always know I'm going to be putting out more content relevant to those things. If you're just creating for creating sake, you're not you're not really creating with the the thought process and the framing of is this a, a piece that is added to my my library that's added to like my resource library? Because yeah. in many ways, that is what you're building. You're building if you're like you're doing talking head or things that are relevant to you as a creator, your business, et cetera. You want to become a resource library because mm-hmm. what happens is people consume the content that is within that library. Then eventually they go to the librarian. It's like, just help me, you know, and that is the, the thing that you want to you want to create versus just having content for content's sake. You want to create that bridge to this is awesome. This is awesome. Damn, I needed this. This was a great video. Hey, can you actually just help me do this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether whatever product you have, if you have a course, if you have some agency uh, on the back end, like that is the best way to set up a layup and then drive a significant amount of, of inbound. Yeah. We talked about demand generation or you talked about demand generation three, four weeks ago. Like this is how you do it. Yeah. You know, like you become the resource. It's very um, the same way, like example. Patty Galloway helps Mr. Beast and then he helps No Kagan and he helps like right. and all Proves of it these. Out. Yeah. He, and then he talks about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, first off, everybody that he's working with and he's talking about their strategies solidifies him, builds credibility around him. Mm-hmm. Then he gives away all the free game. And that's why he has like a wait list of, I think it's like 3000 people oh, to really? work with. Yeah. That's so ignorant. So ignorant. who has a wait list of 3000? If you're 2750, your bitch ass is never getting in. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's like, like I'm it's not even thousands of people. It might if, be more than that. If if I was told I was below a wait list of like 60 on something, I think I'm out. I'm I'm out. I'm out, dude. It's that, why I didn't even apply to his YouTube. At uh, some point you're, you're just disrespecting me. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's it's why I didn't even remember up. when you text me, you're like, Hey, we should become a, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, you know, we should join this. Damn, don't neck him that oh, Okay, it's why his wait list is over 5,000 people long and you can charge up to $1,000 per hour or whatever. Yeah, 5,000 people on a wait list. Crazy. I like, I'm not even going to, why am I going to be 5,001? It's like, figure it out on your own. Yeah. <laughs> That's like. By the time yeah. I'm at, at the top of that wait list, I will, I will be uh, fine. A hundred percent. If he learned it, I can learn it. You and know what I'm you, saying? It's like yeah, one of those. If you don't things. figure it out by then, then yeah. you're fucked. But anyways, Patty is great. Um, well, dude, tell me about Wimbledon. Like, I want to hear more about how they did this too. Cause, and please touch on something that people ask quite a bit, which is posting frequency and the downsides. Yeah. Because if they created a thousand pieces of content, obviously they had to be posting multiple times a day. So, hundred plus. Yeah. Really hundred plus. I mean, or no, close to, close to hundred. Yeah. Plus. That's crazy. So, yeah, just across TikTok and Instagram. So, yeah, let me, let me break this down a bit. So, one of the first things I'll ask you is like, did you see more, was Wimbledon like more on your feed this year? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So very noticeably the, the craziest thing was it first showed up on my Twitter feed. This goes back to our conversation where we talked about audience personas and it popped up on my feed via amplifiers. Like what we talked about marketers, founders, people that talk about what brands are doing. And so I saw one of the, one of their series called overheard at Wimbledon, which is like where they mic'd up Mm -hmm. fans and let fans just react to things naturally whether they're, they're on the park talking whether they're in the stands dude Go ahead, i, heard, say something I bet smart. they heard some out-of-pocket shit some out-of-pocket shit yeah out-of-pocket shit you and see uh you see what the the dish of choice is at wimbledon i saw it was like hundreds of dollars it's like strawberries and cream i, I watched the so the british people should be banned from anything culinary I think this, <laughs> like this is so obvious that they should not be able you can't to be actually saying this on you know my audience skews uh UK. Yeah, shout out Pure Sport represent <laughs> all these brands. Y'all should not cook, bro. Stick to the running. Uh but uh dude, strawberries and cream. That's and crazy. it's like it's like a How much was it? Probably ungodly amounts of pounds, which again, fake currency. But like the thing is, it's it looks you know those things that uh to go Chinese food puts <laughs> yeah. rice in? Like I don't even know what kind of carton that is. It's a carton of strawberries. And they just start dumping some cream in there, pause. <laughs> and it's like, it's a crazy visual watching them make it, and it just it solidified again. Okay, like, one thing I will say though, it's only two fifty. Two fifty. So yeah. are they like the masters two- where things are cheap? No, things aren't cheap. But this is, I guess, it's been the same price since two thousand and ten. I know why you're. Cre- I know why you're making content about Wimbledon. Why? You're trying to go after your wedding next year. You're trying to. You're trying to get that that press coverage next year. No, dude, like honestly, oh, I've, I've, I've uh, never really been into tennis and then I watched Breakpoint. Have you seen that on Netflix? Is that where Zendaya is getting trained? No, that's no. <laughs> that is a uh, that movie <laughs> okay, was wait, honestly wait, 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 so wait, awkward. That. that movie was was very awkward. It yeah, was a no, very uh, weird Breakpoint. Movie. That's like the the Netflix documentary version of uh, like the like Hard Knocks, document. whatever, yeah. something you know, something like yeah. that, where they follow around different players. I watched it and it made me like fall in love with the sport. It's a sick, it's an underrated sport. Extremely underrated. underrated. The aesthetic. Yeah. I love, I was talking to somebody about this recently where what I love about tennis, it's a game where you only can rely on yourself on the court. Yeah. You know, in football to make a big play, you need a quarterback and a receiver, right? Or a running back and the running back needs an O-lineman. And so if like, there's ever these moments where it's like a crazy comeback and then a, a, um, you know, yeah, these crazy comebacks in, in, a, in a player taking over in football, it's like it has to be a team effort. Mm-hmm. Because even if Tom Brady's like in the zone and throwing dimes, the receiver still needs to catch it. He still sure. needs to break tackles. The other sport that this, you know, that you can take over is basketball. I think that's where you love somebody you like. S- you still need like teammates. I mean. 100%. Yeah. But you, there's you still those, the moments where, you know, Kobe Bryant, the 81 point game. Yeah. Like he scored 80 to 90% of their points. Yeah. You know, like, of course, the team still needed to play defense and all the shit, but like he was the one taking over on offense with tennis. It is purely like you are on the court and you can either play very good, very bad. And you could get into like that zone and black out and just play very good and just have a takeover. And I love that about the game. And that's something I didn't I never thought of until I watched breaking point or Breakpoint. Same thing kind of with golf and all those. But anyways, to to not detour too hard. So. With Wimbledon, I saw it again on on Twitter before I ever saw it on Instagram, and so it made me pay attention to it. 
And the thing that blew my mind was how much content they created within a 14 day window. So I pulled up their feed and I'm like, look, scrolling through their content. And I felt like I'd scrolled through like, <laughs> like 10 rows of three. Yeah. And when I click it, it was like 23 hours ago. And yeah. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You tell me all of this was posted in the last 23 hours and you keep going. It's like, mm. that was just yesterday, you know? Right. And at that point it's been 50 plus posts within that, that time frame. So what was crazy was they created over a thousand and forty three pieces of or sorry, they created a thousand and forty three pieces of content in fourteen days. And the exact number, because I have it here, give me a second. They created three hundred and seventy six videos on TikTok in fourteen days, and then they posted six hundred and sixty seven times in fourteen days on Instagram. Bro, that's so unbelievable. Um, there are so many brand accounts that don't even have. 667 posts on their feed that is two years of posting nearly two years of oh, posting yeah. in 14 days like if you yeah. posted something every single day but let me give you some of the the growth right so what what growth can we attribute to this they did 200 000 followers on tiktok in that 14 day span and the thing about TikTok is a lot of those videos are going to continuously over the next 14 days, over the next 30 days, Absolutely. they're going to continue popping. Especially if this is short form stuff, because there's probably unlimited moments that they just were able to highlight that obviously no one would ever see. Like yeah. if you're not on center court in the semifinals la or later, that typically, that's not getting reshared to Bleacher Report. That's not yeah. getting reshared to any of the content amplifiers that, you know, would exist in this market. Yeah. So what an example of taking advantage of the tools at your disposable for your own content distribution. Dude, so good. And then on and then on Instagram, they added over 500,000 followers. Just yesterday, they added 125,000 followers. And that was in the morning. So they probably yeah. really ended the day at like 200 are, plus and, thousand. And now are they like, are most of these reels, carousels? like? So I'm gonna get into that. Okay. So what's the strategy here? And how do you even do this, right? Because this is a hard thing to do. And- for some brand that's listening to this, it probably doesn't seem realistic. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about how we're doing it for, I'm gonna tie this back to how we're doing this for a brand at the CrossFit Games mm. as well. Um, obviously we're not gonna get out a thousand posts, but we're gonna get out a significant amount of content. I mean, dude, a hundred is insane. Yeah. Like a thousand is completely, and I, I do think it's good that you're tying that back into it because as far as how do we make this valuable for anyone watching yeah. this episode, it's like, okay, look, you're not, you're not you Wimbledon. Don't, you don't have a, a 150 matches to take, you know, individual clips from, but like, how can you find those little moments that are worth reposting? So how do you, how do you pull something like this off? What's the strategy here? So the key to this and the key to making this happen was you have to look at Wimbledon throughout the entire day, right? From the second the athletes get to the arena or get to the court, get to the facility to after the match and them going home or them going back to the hotels. Mm -hmm. And so you have to break it down into different segments and then those segments have to have content pillars around each segment. So you have before the match, you have during the match, you have after the match, you have, you have, and then you have even the fans, there's content pillars that you could create around the fans. And so when you look at this, you really break it down into this lens of, okay, there's four segments related to a day in Wimbledon. What are all the ideas and all the content pillars that we can put underneath these that then the team can execute against. So before the match, they have a ton of content pillars. They have behind the scenes, warming up, before walking out, then walking out, press and interviews, right? For the fans, uh, and that's before the match, sorry. Now during the match, this is two parts. During the match, you have the athletes on the court and then you also have the fans, right? So you have, for the fans, you have reactions. Then you have like that split screen of what's happening on the court and then the actual fans reaction as you know, something's going on on the court. Mm -hmm. Then you also have this series that I told you that I love. It's called Overheard at Wimbledon. Then for the players, you have a POV series like POV. You just got the, the craziest point of the day, right? You have wild rallies, just rallies that it's like 35 shots going back and forth, 20 shots back and forth. Yeah. You have point of the day. You have the almost points, which is, I mean, it's very obvious, but it's like, I hit it. It's a beautiful shot. And then it like just goes outside the line. And then you have even the fails, you know, somebody having the easiest shot of the day. And for some reason, because it's so easy, it's like when you're in middle school and you have the wide open touchdown and you drop it because it's too easy. You have those failures. A lot of those for you, huh? None, none. 
No, few, no way those hands work. <laughs> I dropped a touchdown one time in eighth grade. I never got thrown to the rest of the season. I believe it. Yeah. Eighth grade is when you stopped playing football. Freshman year, but yes. <laughs> Very uh, shortly after. Yeah, it was an <laughs> extremely traumatizing experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that is that is during the match. Then you have after the match. You have celebrations. You have the emotional reactions. You have interviews. You have them uh, greeting and meeting fans, right? And right there, you already have 15 plus content pillars. Yeah. Then you have a separate content pillar around the fans. So you have multiple series, like an interview-based series, a quiz series, a challenge series. And then everybody's like, okay, well, how does this, you know, equate to a thousand pieces of content? Everything I just said outside of the fans and the, the series created around the fans has to be, can be made for every single match, yeah, every single athlete, right? From before the match to after the match, everything from the walkouts, the pressing interviews, reactions, POV, wild rallies, like all of this is done for every single match. Yeah. Right. And because of that, then you're able to create 20 to 30 pieces per match mm -hmm. now. And that's how you dominate TikTok. And then for Instagram, everything that's, you know, getting made for TikTok can obviously get uh, repackaged for Instagram, made a little more native there, a little more higher class, a little more beautiful. But at the same time, all of those pillars have photographers that are executing around those same pillars. And now it's photo dumps and carousels and beautiful images attached to these pillars yeah. pov they made that reactions yeah. fans all of that were were photographs taken by their photographers that were also getting integrated into the content and so the the way i like to look at to think about this and i'll think about it from the lens of wimbledon so outside of a huge team you know what is the play here yeah and that's having a live social team having an, a strategy for how you're executing on like the biggest stage this is wimbledon like this is tennis's super bowl how do you execute on a day-to-day -day basis where you're pumping out an insane amount of volume? And the key is you have this live social team of creators creating around these different moments and pillars, and then editors focus on the different content pillars as well, mm -hmm. right? And they're taking, the, the, the creators are taking the content, dumping it, the editors are taking it, getting it from, from an idea to a, a finished piece and then they're moving it to the social media manager who is then publishing it and it's it's very much like a digital assembly line yeah right and that's how you have to be able to see these things so i'm going to tie this all back to uh we're working with tier uh tyr a crossfit brand yeah so they're a swimwear brand and they're, they're dominant in the fitness space and we're working with them on launching a shoe at the crossfit games when's, right? crossfit, when's that August uh, 7th or 8th, like very soon. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. We cranked it around or we turned it around in like two weeks. Are we going? I'm there, yeah. When it, where is it? Fort Worth. Fort what? Worth, man. I don't know. You should come. You should come for a day or two. I actually think I'm out of town. Oh. Well, it's like three, four days. So it depends on what days you're out. But anyways, so we're doing something similar to this for, for tier. And I want to just break, give it, kind of give it to you from like a bird's eye view from how we're thinking about this. So as we were laying out the strategy for tier, we looked at the idea that their entire customer demographic, their like their ideal customer profile, they're all going to be at the CrossFit games, mm -hmm. every single one of them. And so what we want to do is we have to look at the CrossFit games through the lens of, and the crazy thing was like, we developed a strategy before I ever paid attention to Wimbledon. So it only solidified everything that like we gave them. And it was this Truly like, incredible light bulb moment right there. Yeah, it felt great. Yeah. Because we broke it down to there's a strategy before the games, during the games and after the games. Mm -hmm. Right. And now the next layer is because it's, you know, they're launching a shoe. It's not just a content play. It's like this also has to drive significant results on on the, the DTC side and the econ play. We looked at all of the marketing pillars. Right. So you have. Uh, organic social, you have paid ads, you have guerrilla marketing, you have email, SMS, and CR, like landing pages and CRO. And so now everything around that, around those pillars has to work in congruency with the strategy that is before the games, after the games, and uh, sorry, before the games, during the games, and after the games, mm -hmm. right? Email and SMS before the games is very different than email and SMS after the games. Same thing for the landing pages, same thing for the organic content. But the, the thing that I'll talk about most, because it, it, it plays in congruency with uh wimbledon wimbledon here is we developed multiple content pillars for each day 
And one of the, th and so again, before, uh, uh, during and after, and there's different content series, got different content formats for each part of the day. The key to this, and you know, we have a meeting about it tomorrow is there has to be multiple content creators focused on the strategy of each day and some content and, and most of the content creators focused around top of funnel content. And as we get closer to the end, when less people are there, we're focused on more middle funnel, bottom of the funnel content, because those things are going to be fueled, put back into, into paid. Um, but the key is these creators can't be creating then editing because then they're going to miss a lot of content opportunities. So we have to have content creators at the games and then editors that are on deck and their whole job is to drop footage. The editors take the footage and, and get content out ASAP. Yeah. And then the, the marketing team is getting that content published as soon as possible. And so the goal is to be able to publish. Yes. Like you said, like 50 to a hundred pieces of content throughout that weekend, all this and in very similar, we have content pillars around the athletes. Because 46 of the, I think, 100 plus athletes are going to be wearing tier, right? Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the athletes are going to be wearing tier. There's content pillars and series and formats around the athletes. Then the influencers that create content around CrossFit, then the fans. And then those all have their own strategy for, again, like I said, before the games, during the games, after the games. Interesting. Compared to Wimbledon. If you search con, if you go to LinkedIn and you go to Wimbledon and you just search content within people, like their, their employees, they have 83 plus people, right? Like they have a lot of people on the team. We're going to be executing this probably with a team of four to five, like on the content side, there's a yeah. bigger range of individuals for, uh, the marketing side, but that's how we're looking at it. And it's, you know, by the end of it, we should have you know, in that range, the goal is like that 50 to hundred pieces of content. Yeah. What's, how, how do you spell tier? T Y R. T Y R. Yeah. Yeah. Um, dude, that's insane. I, I have so, I have so many questions which you can like answer as you're able to in terms of like just investment and kind of behind the scenes there too. So, because it's really like my knee jerk reaction to this as a bootstrap founder would be like, okay, but I can't hire four to five people to even go to the CrossFit games. And so I'm just curious, like what well, that investment looks like on to your side for the, like, like what is their marketing s budget for this event? And like, I can't give like full on right, numbers. Right. right? <clears throat> but what I will say is most editors to do something like this, you could get them a thousand to $2,000 a day. Yeah. And their sole job is to be there and edit. So when we did, again, like the first time we did Elite Week for the collective, we had an editor whose entire job was just to get the footage that people like Rudy and Charles were shooting and Nolan, and we were just dropping it to the editor and the editor was spitting out content so that we can take advantage of 75 or whatever it was, 65 NFL players yeah. there at one moment, right? So we already had the creative team on staff but you didn't want the creative team to miss an, imp uh, an important moment, right? There was a, and I'll give you an- uh, That's why you separate the editors and the creators. Yes, so I'll give you one example. There was one moment at the at Elite Week two or three years ago where you went to it this year, right? Mm -hmm. And you yeah. went to that- You're talking about the Micah Parsons thing? Or the, race? Like the race? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. come on, don't, don't ruin the piece from, I'm just kidding, Come I'm kidding. Kid. So you, you went to Del, Del Valley High School. Yeah. Such a beautiful campus for such a trash ass school. One in ten. I know. They're and the, the most beautiful. No, it's crazy. Indoor facility, most beautiful, uh, like uh, gym and whatnot. And that's where Rudy went, actually, <laughs> Del Valley. <laughs> so just for context, that's a, an insane stray for him to catch. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> and uh, anyways, long story short, we the way it worked was. We, you know, we had planned ideas for Elite Week and we were trying to shoot this docu-series and it ended up, you know, crushing. But there was a moment where all the DBs and, and uh, linebackers and running backs lined up to race because you get a bunch of NFL players doing drills, an open field there in the off season. It's like Derwin James telling Mike, I'm faster than you. And no, then, insane. you know, and this yeah. player saying, no, I'm, fa I'm the fastest here. And then all of a sudden, David Mulligan is like, I got $1,000 on the line. Whoever whoever wins has a thousand band or gets a you know thousand dollars. And all of a sudden they line up. This was not a planned moment, right? But it's Aiden Nolan, Rudy, 
Charles, all of you go get that. Like yeah. that is a big, a big moment. Like let's get that. Cause that's going to be a viral piece of content. Cause if you think about it from the lens of all the aggregators, ESPN is going to push, uh, put that on there. 100%. NFL network, et cetera. You got big names. You got a, a dollar figure. You got a contrast it, of linebackers exactly. versus corners. Exactly. And you have big stars. Mm -hmm. And so they go do it. And I remember we, we shot it and we were instantly like, we need to turn this around ASAP. So that day we were going go-karting with all those players. And we had this back room at the collective and where I'm, I'm in the back room and I'm like, we need this edited like in the next hour. Like we need to get this out ASAP. Yeah. So we got it out within the hour before we went to, uh, before we went go-karting with all the players. And dude, within the hour or two, it was like all of these channels hitting you up. Like, can I repost this? ESPN, NFL, pops up on NFL Network later that day. Yeah. And the key here was speed, right? The key 100%. was having, being able to execute this very fast and then having like being able to to take advantage of these moments and get them out. And how do you do that? You have to have the creator and the editor. They can't be the same people because then the, especially for big events like this, because if not, you have the, the creator, his only time to edit is after, mm -hmm. you know, and their only time to do that is, is the time that between the, the end of the event and the next morning. And so you, you have to have the editors on staff or, you know, contracted, so that as the event's going on, you're publishing content. Another co brand that does this really well is like F1. Mm -hmm. When F1's in Austin, the amount of creators and editors that they have in a back room just cranking content is crazy because the creators are out there shooting and then they're coming back in and just dumping and yeah. dumping. And then they're editing and they're going out and getting more, more moments. So for the small brand, you could do this with somebody that's very good at shooting on their iPhone and somebody's very good at editing on their iPhone. And that is not an expensive thing, but the ROI will be there because if you're doing it right, you're getting enough content that's going to, can be used for organic and paid ads. And the, in the impressions based on, let's say each person's a thousand dollars a day, which is not that much. And it's like a realistic number based on that. So $2,000 and you publish 10 to 20 pieces of content, you know what you're doing on the content side. Chances are you're going to, at by the end of a three, four day span, you're going to have four to 500,000 impressions. Yeah. 600,000 impressions in that range. If you're very well, if you're very good, you have a bigger team, you know what you're doing. You, you know how to go viral. You know how to get hundreds of thousands of views. There's chances that you're getting 20 million impressions, mm -hmm. 50 million impressions. I have a good feeling with tier. We're going to, we're going to get in that ballpark of like 50 million plus impressions within a four day span. Yeah. And, and again, the, the biggest thing to justify that in someone's brain is you're going to be spending money on ads regardless. Yeah. But the long-term benefit of getting, of earning someone's attention rather than paying for it is so, so high. You yeah. now are not bugging them to get their attention. They like you. And yeah. so, especially for tier, I mean, I'm sure this is like a very close knit, uh, you know, audience of CrossFit folks, like, you know, by amplifying the game, by amplifying all that stuff, by showing that investment that they're going to be doing, they could put whatever marketing spend they're going to use on this into paid ads and try and convert people to buy their shoes. Or they could have this go viral grassroots and everyone be talking about, man, that stuff from tier was so dope. Yeah. And that's going to actually get the product to have real like demand that Impact. transcends just paying for eyeballs. Yeah. So yeah, I, great. I can't to see what happens with this. It was me cool. Too. So a few, few, I appreciate that. A few cool layers to it that I think you'll like. It's all we're uh, we're gonna have somebody there filming the entire thing, the entire campaign getting launched. So we're making a brand builders episode out of it, mm. which should be super cool. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff that we're I can't talk about yet, but we're doing on the guerrilla marketing side um, that it's gonna be interesting to talk about on on the pod. Did you hitting a billboard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. CrossFit talk. is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's. Yeah, I can't, I can't talk about it too much, but um, basically the reason you make that joke, right? CrossFit is cool is because a lot of the brands in CrossFit are like squares. Mm -hmm. They're lame. And so the way we're trying to approach this is like, what has never been done in this sport? Everybody has relatively done the same execution, same things at the games, same campaign for the games. And we're trying, and, and tier in the past, like this is why, you know, they're bringing us on and is... A lot of the brands just execute the same and tears like we're tired of that like because that's not who we are as a brand like we're very 
against the grain. We're very like in house. If you hung out with us, we're uh, we're rebels in many ways. But then our content doesn't feel like that, mm. you know. And so a lot of what's going into this campaign is how are we uh, portraying that? That's just who we are. That's our roots. But we're and we're going to sh- prove that by, you know, creating a, a campaign and executing on a campaign that nobody's really seen in, in CrossFit. So are they primarily a swimmer brand? They started as a swimmer brand, I think in the eighties yeah. and they, they've just dominated that sport. And then they've, you know, transitioned into also being like, uh, into their, uh, their YouTube channel is very heavy. Yeah. On sport, swimming. Or on swimming. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, they, ha- they have a good eye for content. Like you can tell that they invest in it and care about it, but I think to your point, like just, you know, posting frequency. I mean, so many brands that I, you know, I know you see this in your conversations, but content velocity is so important to so many yeah. brands these days. They, yeah. it's so hard to scale up a team of competent people across, because typically this really is something that uh, an agency umbrella is best at creating, which yeah. is tying together several contractors and freelancers in yeah. a local area. And so it's so hard for Tier to build out a content team because why would they do that when they can just work with, you know, an agency boots on the ground in Texas, 100% and nail something like this. All right. That's a wrap on episode yeah. 30, 37. If you enjoyed this episode, please, uh, the best thing for us to make better content for you is to leave a comment on the YouTube and tell us what you want to see next. Like, I don't know about you, but that shapes like the things we know we all want to hear that you want us to talk about. Um, and just showing love there also just helps us grow the channel a lot and puts us better in the algorithm. So, you know, if you enjoyed this episode, shoot us a comment on YouTube, uh, leave a review on Spotify, Apple, share with a friend. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I used to always send my favorite podcast to people. It was kind of like a little litmus test of like, oh, is this person actually on my vibe? Like, cause if you like the same podcast, you're probably gonna be pretty similar. Do the other thing that you it's do a good is- friend test. It is. It is a good friend test. The other thing that you do is you send the the episode and then the next time you hang out, you bring, bring it up. up very naturally in the conversation to see if they're really about it or not. They never do. They never watch. Anyways, that's a wrap. We'll catch you all next week. Peace.